November 12th, millions of followers of Baha'u'llah throughout the world celebrate the birth of the founder of their faith. They believe Baha'u'llah's prophetic vision of a united world at peace is attainable. A world not of hatred and competition, but of unity and diversity based on cooperation and justice. People and nations must learn to give up their religious, racial, and national prejudices and ardently seek peace through mutual respect, consultation, and persistent effort. In this program, we will have a glimpse of the life of Baha'u'llah as a prisoner and exile in the places where he spent the last part of his life. Baha'u'llah had already been in exile for 16 years. The rulers of the Persian and Ottoman empires were fearful of Baha'u'llah's teachings about a new world order. They exiled him first to Iraq, then to Turkey, and finally to the prison city of Akka. But their efforts to stop his influence failed. Baha'u'llah's family shared his exile and imprisonment. Among them was the unique figure of Abdul Baha, Baha'u'llah's eldest son. After half a century of imprisonment, Abdul Baha took Baha'u'llah's message to the West, traveling through Europe, the United States, and Canada. Our host during this visit to the Holy Land is Madame Ruhia Rabani, the former Mary Maxwell, who was born and raised in Montreal. For many years, she has lived in the Holy Land and has played a leading role in the international growth and development of the Baha'i community. Madame Rabani now takes us on a pilgrimage to those places associated with Baha'u'llah's life in the Holy Land. In 1868, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, arrived at Akka in Palestine on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Akka was a heavily protected fortress city where Turkish troops were garrisoned. It was also the worst penal colony in the Turkish Empire. Baha'u'llah was a prisoner of the Sultan of Turkey. Across the Bay of Akka lies Mount Carmel with Haifa at its foot. In those days, people walked or came on horseback from one town to the other along the beach as there was no other road. In the port of Haifa, Baha'u'llah, his family, and some of his followers about 70 men, women, and children disembarked from a steamer which had brought them from Turkey and were then taken across the bay in a sailing boat to Akka. Already Baha'u'llah had suffered 16 years of imprisonment and exile, first in Persia, his native land, then in Iraq and Turkey. For the remaining 24 years of his life, he would be the prisoner of Akka. His sole crime was the extremely liberal, tolerant, and progressive message he taught. For this, he was tortured, put in chains, condemned to death, imprisoned, and exiled at the instigation of a fanatical Muslim clergy whose vengeance pursued him for 40 years. In the terrible heat of August, Baha'u'llah disembarked at this sea gate and entered what he described as the most desolate city in the world with a detestable climate and foul water. He was led by his guards through its narrow, stinking lanes. The object of the curiosity and mockery of its inhabitants. Finally, he arrived at the army barracks and entered this prison. For two years and two months, he and his companions were strictly confined in this inner citadel. Pilgrims who sometimes walked four months from Persia would stand beyond the moats, hoping to glimpse their Lord 
in the dark windows of the prison. Baha'u'llah suffered more behind those bars than any other time in his life. Almost all the 70 people fell ill with malaria or dysentery. Three died. But the crowning blow for him and his saintly wife, Nawab, the faithful companion of all his exiles, the mother of his most distinguished children, was the death of their 22-year-old son, Mehdi. The weary years went by. Nine bleak and stormy winters Baha'u'llah spent as a prisoner in Akka. After the first two terrible years of confinement in the barracks, he and his followers were moved to other buildings. Finally, Baha'u'llah and his family came to live in this house. Gradually, the power of his personality and the beauty of his character won the admiration and friendship of the officials. Although this house is now visited as one building, originally it was two separate houses, both are now known as the House of Abu. Baha'u'llah arrived in the city of Akka at the end of August, 1868. And by 1871, he was free of his imprisonment in the barracks and he moved to this house with his family. One must remember in looking at this room that this is not the way it was in his days because it was changed when Abdul Baha later lived here after the ascension of Baha'u'llah. As a matter of fact, Abdul Baha used to come and sleep in this room up to practically the very end of his life. It was in this room, which is because of this fact so very sacred to the Baha'is of the world, that Baha'u'llah revealed the Kitabi Akdas, which is the charter of the future world order, the future world civilization of Baha'u'llah, and the book that is the repository of his laws and his ordinances. You can see in this room the way Abdul Baha lived. He lived so simply. That should be a source of great encouragement to the Baha'is in many countries who themselves live under very simple circumstances. It was Abdul Baha who ended the bitterest years of his father's captivity. Although the sentence of life imprisonment was never repealed, after almost 10 years, the gate of the prison city was opened to Baha'u'llah. Now, admired by high officials and revered by the populace who called him His Highness and the august leader, he was at last free to move about the countryside. Near Akka was a beautiful garden on an island in the river. Abdul Baha rented this for Baha'u'llah, who called it Rizwan, which means paradise, surely a paradise for the man, now over 60, who still bore the marks of the chains he wore four months in a dungeon in Tehran. Under the shade of mulberry trees surrounded by the river, this beautiful spot now became one of Baha'u'llah's favorite retreats. On these benches, carefully preserved as shown in this old photograph, he would sit, dictating letters to his secretary or receiving pilgrims and guests. In Akka, he once told Abdul Baha, the country is the world of the soul, the city, the world of bodies. On dusty paths through the wilderness, Baha'u'llah sometimes moved about by carriage or riding a donkey. Though a prisoner until he died, the years of strict confinement were over. As Abdul Baha said, if his light before the days in Akka was like a star, there it became like a mighty sun. Abdul Baha at last succeeded in acquiring a worthy residence for his father, the beautiful Oriental Palace at Baji. 
This old photograph shows how it must have looked in those days. At this stoop, Baha'u'llah used to mount his donkey. It has been carefully preserved by Shoghi Effendi. About 1880, Baha'u'llah came to live here in what he called his lofty mansion. He occupied that corner room. His beloved son had brought him here where he found a measure of peace during the last 12 years of his life, weary from over 30 years of perpetual persecution, imprisonment, and exile. This is the room in which Professor E. G. Brown of Cambridge University in April 1890 had a very important interview and a very unique interview with Baha'u'llah. He describes him in this way. He says, the face of him on whom I gazed, I can never forget, though I cannot describe it. Those piercing eyes seem to read one's very soul. Power and authority sat on that ample brow. A mild, dignified voice bade me be seated. Praise be to God that thou hast attained. Thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile. We desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations, yet they deem us a stirrer up of strife and sedition worthy of bondage and banishment that all nations should be one in faith and all men as brothers, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened, that diversity of religion should cease and differences of race be annulled. What harm is there in this? Yet so it shall be. These fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away and the most great peace shall come. Baha'u'llah's room opened onto this secluded court on the balcony where he could enjoy privacy. The colored glass screen and marble fountain made it cool and shady in summer and protected from the rain in winter. Below it is one of the loveliest gardens in Baji. It was in this room that Baha'u'llah passed away on May the 29th, 1892. And before he died, he called his family and his followers together and he said, I am well pleased with you all. The gentleness, the loving kindness of Baha'u'llah, his patience are indescribable, not only his teachings are so marvelous and will change the whole life of men on this planet, but his love and his tenderness are unbelievable. And I think you feel him closer in this room than in any other place in the Holy Land. It's as if you could, well, almost touch the, the hem of his robe and almost see him and hear his voice when you come into this very precious room. A simple beauty surrounds Baha'u'llah's resting place. From it, an almost tangible sense of peace flows out. His words echo in our ears. We desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations. The happiness of the nations.
Baha'u'llah's life of exile had come to a close here at Baji. Though still a political prisoner, the Messenger of God was able to complete more than 100 volumes, a body of sacred writings dealing with a vast array of subjects. This wealth of divine guidance is centered on the principle of the oneness of humanity. It provides the blueprint for building a global civilization. Baha'u'llah explained that humanity is emerging today from its adolescence into the period of its maturity, and that the time in which we are now living would see terrible wars and human agony. But he assures us that as this period comes to an end, a new age of international peace and harmony would come to stay. O oh, well-beloved ones, regard ye not one another as strangers. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. We cherish the hope that the light of justice may shine upon the world and sanctify it from tyranny. Here at Baji, Baha'u'llah finished the work of setting down those principles necessary for world unity. The harmony of science and true religion the equality of women and men, the need for economic justice, and the elimination of all forms of prejudice. The coming world unity described by Baha'u'llah will be a commonwealth of nations in which cultural diversity and expression is cherished and the participation of all human beings is essential. Today, increasing numbers of people from all backgrounds are coming to visit these gardens. Many more around the world are learning about Baha'u'llah's teachings and his central theme of unity in diversity. Consider the flowers of the garden. Though differing in kind, color, form, and shape, yet this diversity increaseth their charm and addeth unto their beauty. In like manner, when diverse shades of thought, temperament, and character are brought together, the beauty and glory of human perfection will be revealed and made manifest. Prayer and meditation are the foundations of the individual spiritual life. However, Baha'u'llah also taught that service to humanity is essential to spiritual development. Those who today dedicate themselves to the service of the entire human race are helping to spiritualize the planet as well as their own individual lives. Baha'u'llah taught that human beings are not innately aggressive or sinful. Rather, he sees them as a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. Education can alone cause it to reveal its treasures and enable mankind to benefit therefrom. From the days when Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha arrived in Akka in a sailing boat as prisoners, to these days when the shrine on Mount Carmel is visited by tens of thousands of tourists each year from all over the world, is indeed a miraculous change in the fortunes of a persecuted faith. The Baha'i Shrine is included in most tours. During the three hours every morning when it is open to the public, often over 3,000 people visit it. The history of this shrine is unique. The prophet Isaiah called Carmel the mountain of the Lord, to which all nations will flow. Its site was chosen by Baha'u'llah. Its style was planned by Abdu'l-Bahá, who said that when completed, it must have a colonnade and dome. In the upper garden behind the shrine, there still stands the circle of cypress trees, which mark the spot where Baha'u'lláh once sat, and instructed Abdu'l-Bahá to purchase this land and build the Bab's tomb here.
Photographs are not permitted inside the shrines because they are sacred tombs. But everyone enjoys taking pictures outside as souvenirs of their visit. Before Baha'u'llah died, many people came from the East to meet him. In Abdul Baha's days, many more came from East and West. In Shoghi Fendi's days, the numbers greatly increased. Now thousands of pilgrims pour in from every country, every background, every race. They gather here in what was the Oriental Baha'i Pilgrim House. The pilgrims are reminded that Baha'i houses of worship are open to all. As there are no priests in our faith, no sermons are preached. Instead, words from the sacred scriptures of all revealed religions are read. Mount Carmel, the home of Elijah, the mountain of God of Isaiah, has seen the flowering of the majestic spiritual and administrative center of the Baha'i international community. The democratically elected international executive of the Baha'i community works here in the seat of the Universal House of Justice. Like the thousands of elected Baha'i councils around the world, it functions on the basis of mutual deliberation and consultation. The foundation of the new world order envisaged by Baha'u'llah rests on this principle of consultation without domination by any group or individual. Baha'is are painfully aware of the conflict and runaway materialism which afflict our world but they understand these modern day problems to be like the painful birth of a new era in human history. Just as a child grows and matures from infancy to childhood and undergoes the difficult changes of adolescence, so too humanity is now moving from adolescence to its adulthood. Competition and strife, which typically mark adolescence, will give way to cooperation and harmony to an age of greater justice and wisdom. The guidance which streamed from Baha'u'llah's pen for 40 years provides us with the necessary principles for creating unity in the human family. Baha'u'llah urged the members of the human family to take counsel together, to do that which profiteth all of humanity, to associate with all people in a spirit of friendliness and fellowship, and to act in a manner which brings about unity. He said, the well-being of mankind, its peace and security, are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. From the Baha'i Shrine on the side of Mount Carmel, the gaze of visitors falls along the tree-lined path running from the foot of the mountain up to the shrine, and they look out through the graceful pillars of the Universal House of Justice, across the Bay of Haifa to the prison city of Akka, where Baha'u'llah had been imprisoned for so many years. <laughs> 